There are many ways in which whiskey can call on us to serve. You can taste it, you can talk about it, you can research and analyze it at length, or you can make the stuff. And it feels that my next guest, Craig Johnston, has done pretty much the lot of it. Having cut his teeth on a variety of roles here in Scotland, he then turned his world upside down, moved to Tasmania, and is now quality control manager at Lark Distillery in Hobart. He joins me now. Uh, Craig Johnston, welcome. Thanks, Sam. It's good to be here. So it really feels like you've had an extraordinary variety of roles across the whiskey industry, starting at Glen Kinchy, going via the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, a stint at Bruchladi, and now you're at Lark. Guiding, promoting, creating, tasting. How has each role changed your outlook on the whiskey in your care? Um, I think, you're, first of all, you're, you're correct in that the, just the, the, the breadth of these roles and also the, the different people and philosophies I've come across have, um, have stood me in, in really good stead to get, get to where I'm at. Um, I was, uh, I would say, fortunate to get into the industry. Back when I was, um, you know, 17, I had really no idea about whiskey. Um, none of my immediate family um, really consumed the stuff apart from a couple of uncles who liked a, a, you know, a famous grouse or a Johnny Walker black label. And it just, just so happened that in my final year at high school, um, I found that what I, the, the part of my, I guess, education that probably needed a bit of work was public speaking. Mm. So um, uh, I, I spoke to my dad's sister, my Auntie Mary, and it turns out she'd worked at Glen Kinchy Distillery. Uh, she was a gin drinker, so had, you know, didn't really like the whiskey, but mm. um, saw an opportunity to, to basically get in front of an audience and, and um, get my public speaking skills up. Hmm. Uh, and on that first first day at the distillery, it was my 18th birthday. Um, I was allowed to uh, basically talk to, to people I'd never met before about a subject that at that time, obviously, I knew very little about. And I remember my first dram was was five past ten in the morning on that on that day, and it was a Glenkinchy ten, and and the flavours just sort of they, they they hit me, I suppose. So that was that was where I fell in love with the liquid. But um, it was really with that that role that um, I, my, my outlook completely changed on, I guess, Scotland, on, on, on whiskey, also on customer service and tourism. Mm. Um, the ladies I work with in the tour, the, in the uh, visitor center there, really uh, hammered home that idea that every single person that walks through the door um, is there for a good time. And, and if you can entertain them and then punctuate that entertainment with a, a, a good drama and a good story, then you, you sort of would make their, make their trip so yeah. the, the, the time, yeah, the time at Glenkinchy obviously gave me a beginner's guide to single malt whiskey, but also gave me that, that grounding in customer service um, to the point that, you know, during university, I would work there during the day at the weekends. And then uh, of an evening, I was searching for other things to do and, and find a job with the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society, as you mentioned. So, I'd, you know, on a Saturday night, I'd work from nine to five at the local distillery. And then six o'clock until, you know, midnight, one in the morning at the local single cask, single malt whiskey bar. Wow. Um, and I got a, just a, another real insight into a different facet of the industry, you know, into that, that single cask world where, yeah. you know, that you get the, the rarest of the rare, I suppose, the, the hidden gems, the, the whiskies that, you know, put their flaws out for everyone to, to admire, I suppose. Um, We're putting it, yeah. Yeah. After university, um, I applied to every distillery that you know that I possibly could um, I actually got a call back from Highland Park in McAllen mm -hmm. and they said that they wanted me to to travel to to western Canada be based in Vancouver and and basically be their single malt ambassador for for the west coast so I looked after everywhere from Toronto to Vancouver and everywhere in between and I guess that was the first time I saw how you know big the world of of, of scotch was um, how this the stories permeated and the, the sort of the, the, the magic of, of whiskey was was global and yep. I think if I'd at that time gone back to see the, the, the distillers at Glen Kinchy and told them that their product was on a shelf halfway around the world, they probably wouldn't believe you. <laughs> you know, they they made two million liters of the stuff a year and had no idea who was consuming that. Mm. Um, so that that really opened my eyes to the size of the industry. Um I then moved back to Scotland, went back to the, the Malt Whiskey Society for a little while, um, did a, a little bit of travel with them, and then Brooklady came calling, and, and I think that was, you know, that immersion into Isla is, it, it's something that everyone should go through. <laughs> um, 
you know, that takes customer service to the next level. That goes from a, a, a mindset of, you know, you're, you're here to entertain tourists to everyone on this island could possibly end up, you know, uh, in your home and, and welcome and, and, and having a dram with you. And that, that kind of, that, that friendliness and, and um, sort of, I don't know, that, just that, that magical idea that everyone who comes to visit you is special was, was, was taken to the next level. Mm. And then you marry that with the, you know, the, just the, the entertainment and impulse and, and, you know, mastery of Jim McEwen and Duncan McGilvery. And, uh, and you've just got this, this kind of heady mixture of amazing storytelling, incredible technical ability, mm. um, guys that were making whiskey do things that probably no one else has even now managed to, managed to, to, to recreate. Um, and, and again, Im- embed it all in this, this, this magic of, of entertainment and story and, and, and tourism, which was phenomenal. Hmm. Um, while I was there, I then I got another opportunity to move to Dubai. Um, and, and that was really probably the toughest decision I ever had to make. Do I want to leave Brooklady? And the answer was no. And uh, I'm still, I'm very, I'm very glad I did because it, it, it let me see behind the scenes. Mm. sales and marketing you know buying and selling um i got to really increase my network and, and meet more people and, and also uh i would say just experiencing a new region a new way of doing business um a different type of fantastic hospitality you know the the, the locals there had a uh, just a, a different view on the world which was which was fascinating um and i got to Oh, a very tough 18 months in the desert because I'm just not a warm, warm weather kind of person. <laughs> um, and I, I got a call from Chris Thompson, who uh, is the head distiller down, down here at Lark, who I still work with today. And him and I had met uh, at Edinburgh while I was at the Malt Whiskey Society. He had, um, well, let's, let's put it this way, he decided he wanted to stay in Scotland a bit longer. So he slept on my couch for a little while and we became really good friends or... You know, as, as some people would put it, he, he now knows so much about me, I can't afford him as an enemy. <laughs> um, and he'd reached out to me knowing that, that I had this kind of vast network of friends in the industry because he needed a distiller. Mm. And the massive hole in, in my entire experience was actually producing this stuff. So mm. um, I wrote back to him and said, look, I politely decline your offer of me sharing this job advert. Um, instead, here is my application, essentially. And sent him my CV. And I went through the interview process. Uh, and, and in 2014 was invited down here to Tassie to, to learn on the distilling floor. And um, yeah, my eyes were, were yet again opened no uh, in such a, an incredible way. Um, we'll probably touch on that, that time uh, you know, in, in, in a little while, but just to, between then and now, I also did a bit, a bit of a sabbatical for a year, year and a bit with Glendronic, Ben Riek and Glenn Glasser. Mm-hmm. Um, learn, you know, learning more about logistics and traveling all, of, all around Asia with them. So I got to see the, the wonderful world that is the exploding market in Asia, in places like Japan and China and Singapore and, and Malaysia. Yeah. Uh, and, and yeah, just really got to, to sink my teeth in there before moving back down to Tassie, um, where now, as I say, I get to essentially cast my eye over, over everything that leaves Lark Distillery, um, whether as whiskey or gin or you know, these days, hand sanitizer. So well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's been a bit of a roller coaster. That's, that's, that's probably the shortest version of it I can give you. Yeah. If that's the shortest version, it just means that <clears throat> when it comes to whiskey, you are so incredibly well-rounded any aspect of it. And I think that probably in a position at a, a distillery in an up and coming um, distilling region is going to be incredible experience. But so I'm kind of touching on that. Tasmania, is on its way to becoming a real whiskey producing powerhouse, which I'm not sure that everybody knows about, but there's coming up to what, 60 distilleries on the island. Um, so what is it that makes yeah. Tassie such a hotspot for whiskey? Um, it was a bit of a, a perfect storm. I mean, it was, so the, the, the industry was started in 1992 by Bill Lark, who founded Lark Distilling Company. Um, and Bill's, Bill's still very much part of the furniture here. He still pops his head in and, we get him involved in, in tasting panels and he, he does a lot of ambassadorial stuff, not just for us as a distillery, but for the rest of the industry as well. Mm. And um, I mean, the story, the story goes that him and his brother-in-law were in a, 
essentially they were on a fishing trip and they'd stopped in a park in Bothell, uh, which is in the highlands of, of Tassie, uh, to have a, essentially have a, a, have a dram and, and a barbecue. Um, I think they were cooking sausages because they hadn't caught any fish. Um, and they were having a, a, a Glenfiddich and his brother-in-law said to him, why has no one decided to make this in Tasmania? You know, we've got the water, we've got the, the, the climate, we grow decent barley, um, we know how to make a beer. Mm. So why, why, you know, why has no one done this before? So, you know, probably set a little bit of a, uh, a seed in Bill's brain and he went away and researched it and, and found this, this draconian law. Uh, from the 1800s that said you couldn't have a distillery that was basically smaller than well, a certain size. I think it was something like 200,000 liters a year. Mm -hmm. So it was prohibitive. Um, so he went and spoke to, you know, friends of his and, and managed to get in touch with government. And eventually they changed the law that allowed, basically started allowing craft scale distilling in Australia with a license. And that was in 1992. Um, our current CEO actually still argues that we're a 28 year startup. Um, you know, the, the, the industry, uh, has, has come on leaps and bounds since Bill started distilling on his, on his kitchen table. But what he's managed to do is he's managed to inspire, you know, lots of people to, to take up this, this opportunity because we, um, or because he'd done the, the, the groundwork, he'd found a local uh, boiler maker who made stills for him. Mm. So suddenly we have a, we have a still, a coppersmith industry. Um, there's now two fantastic coppersmiths down here on the island. Uh, he found a, a local guy who um, was a fantastic carpenter, and he decided to to um, to make beer. So we have uh, to make casks. Sorry. So he he is he started the Tasmanian Cask Company, and they would buy Australian tawny port, Australian um, well apera, which is our, our version of sherry down here, mm -hmm. wine casks. They'd import bourbon casks and recouper them. Uh, into 100 litres. So our quarter cask here in, in Australia is 100 litres. And that's simply because that's how much whiskey Bill made with one batch of his still. So the, <laughs> the cask size was actually set around what Bill started to do as well. Um, we have two very large local breweries here who only use Tassie barley. So we had a, a great source of, of Tasmanian you know, um, brewing barley. Um, and because the, the costs in terms of setup of the actual equipment are actually not too prohibitive because you can make on a small scale, more and more people basically jumped on the bandwagon. Um, and we're at this point now where I think when I started in 2014, the, we were just hitting, you know, starting the, the crest of the wave. Mm. So we were, we were at that point where if I'd been hired a year before, I probably would have been laid off because no one was buying the stuff. But then Sullivan's Cove, you know, for one of their um, older products, one best whiskey in the world. Mm. And that set the Tassie industry off. And suddenly everyone who had a bit of coin decided that they wanted to, to invest and started to, you know, invest in stills and casks and barley. And, and since then, we've got everything from, you know, your uh, retired couple who make, uh, some of them make as little as a thousand liters a year. It's right to, to my... To manage, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, you've, you know, you've got these little thousand litre a year micro distilleries. Yeah. And on the other hand, um, we've, every time you put something on the shelf, it disappears. So we are at the moment looking at, you know, we're trying to get above quarter of a million next year mm. uh, in terms of litres of production. So that's kind of where, where Lark's at. And we've got everything in between. We've got whiskey made from brandy stills. We've got a guy who has the only carbon negative distillery we know of in the world. Mm. So he grows rye. Mm -hmm. Uh, he makes his own rye whiskey, um, but all of the fuel he uses in his distillery is essentially reconstituted fat from the local takeaway. Nice. So, yeah, so he, he, he has what he describes as a carbon negative footprint. Um, and he makes this big, just dirty, gritty, incredible rye whiskey that is, yeah, you just can't find it anywhere else in the world. Hmm. So it's it's a real bizarre landscape of, as you say, 60 odd players. Um, everyone does their own thing and puts their own twist on it. And I think part, part of the charm is you have to come here to get the stuff. Mm. But obviously the biggest challenge is you also have to come here to get the stuff. So, yeah. you know, it's a, uh, yeah, it's, it's a phenomenal place to be. It's a, it's a real, it's a hotbed for innovation. That's for sure. <clears throat> it sounds like one of those great success stories where just a small change to the law happens and that just lets 
all manner of people jump in and do their own thing with yeah. it. Um, does it feel like, um, like Tazzy Whiskey at the moment is developing a kind of identity or is actually the identity the sheer variety of it? Right now, I'd say the identity, identity is a pretty much a, the variety of it where mm. almost everyone has, um, has taken some, some inspiration from Bill. So if you were to say there was a style, um, uh, I would say from a new make spirit, it's pretty oily. Um, mm -hmm. because the stills the stills that we have are very short okay. you know the the largest still on the island just now i think is three or four thousand liters in size mm -hmm. um we are currently working with a two two thousand and a nine hundred liter pair mm. um and i've made the the decision that when we expand we're going to keep that ratio because that that oiliness of spirit is is to me something that we just i never got to play with in scotland you yeah, never see yeah. that that small size. You you might see it in places like Dornock or um, uh, Stra it was at Strathern. Um, those places have a scale, you know, uh, comparable to ours. But mm. to play with that from a malt whiskey perspective, and and also then knowing all the tricks of the trade from back home is 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 phenomenal. Yeah. So you know, uh, I'd say the small still heavy spirit is probably as close to a style as you can you can say that Tazzy has. But, on the other yeah. hand, we've got guys. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I was say, yeah, you can already sort of see something emerging. Like in Scotland, there's the real um, kind of superstition almost that if you change anything about your traditional stills, you're going to change the whiskey. And so because Tazzy started off with the smaller still style, that's kind of going to get set and um, that's going to iterate over time. But yeah, it feels like small stills it, may well be the character that's emerging. I think... I think it will. I think what will be what will be interesting to see is what you know when when we finally um, hit you know hit your shores, hit hit places like the UK and the US and and China and Japan uh, and Malaysia and Singapore and all you know the what the, the emerging and and also mature markets. It'll be interesting to see what what variety of of products get there because the small still stuff is very much uh, obviously hampered by scale. Mm. So I think when when it finally you know when we when we finally as an island to get enough product to to um, to export, you'll probably find that you'll have the guys like Hellier's Road who have always been the entry level in terms of price point, but now have fourteen, fifteen, sixteen year old whiskey on the shelf, which is phenomenal. Mm. They've got one twenty two thousand liter pot still. But Whoa. what's amazing is the cone on it is about the same size as ours. <laughs> so they just built a massive you know a massive pot and put a wee cone on the top. Yeah. You've also then got um, Sullivan's Cove produce everything from a brandy alambic. Um, the new distilleries coming online will go to larger stills. They'll go okay. to eight and nine thousand liter pots, but that will not, to me, that 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 will be completely different to the stuff we are producing at mm. Mark. So we are we are convinced that that small that small stills uh, sizes is what makes our whiskey so unique. So I think when mm. we start to export Tazzy whiskey as a category. I think as customers and consumers, you'll be able to choose. You'll be able to see that oily style. You'll have that, that lighter style from the big stills. You'll have the older, the younger, the port, the sherry, the bourbon. So we'll, we'll be, um, yeah, we'll have a, a nice variety when we finally uh, get our finger out and, and start sending the stuff abroad. Looking forward to that. And yeah. uh, your role at the distillery, uh, actually, what, is a, what does a typical day look like for you? Oh, it's, I mean, I, I really, I came back on board in August and I don't think I've had uh, a day that's looked the same. So my, my old role as distillery manager back in 2014, 2015 was, was one of those where you, you wake up and you go to the distillery at four o'clock or six in the morning, depending on the day. Mm. And you'd get the stills on, you'd catch the sunrise um, and then you'd basically brew in. So you're mashing in by hand. You know, you're you're smelling and tasting every ferment from the week before. Wow. Um, you're making your your cuts by aroma and flavour, so you're tasting everything and, and get, really getting into how new make actually um, develops through a distillation. That's probably a skill that that we um, are, I would say, more developed than a lot of markets right now, just simply because a lot of the time it's hundred year old recipes that people are following. So the yeah. The master blenders and head distillers have that knowledge, but we, we got that on the distilling floor. Today it's a bit different. Um, so I guess one of my big 
responsibilities is, is making sure that the next generation of distillers gets those skills. So I'd, I'll pitch up at um, a little bit later these days, seven or eight in the morning, um, and you know check in, check in with the guys and girls on the floor, um, see what's happening with the first cuts. Mm. Um, and then right now my big project is, is putting a column still in um, to basically make more uh, neutral spirit for our gin, but also for the, the grow need of hand sanitizer. So that's the, the big thing. And then in between that, I'm still planning for a distillery expansion and then the most important thing that we do is is tasting panel. So I will either bring bring samples uh, home with me if I don't have time during the day, but I'll always try and find some time to nose and taste uh, what the, the, the master blenders put together and make sure that it's good enough to go into a lark bottle. So it's a very varied role, um, but it's very exciting. There's lots of big projects, but there's also those little things that are just so important to the quality of the final, final uh, product. And you touched on the um, that the current project is putting in a whole new column still, uh, which at this time Lark has already got involved with the, the smaller gin stills to make a bit of hand sanitizer. But this new column still uh, is also going to be employed for that function. Yeah, it was. Um, I think it's one of those things that if if you'd said to me, you know. Um, uh, if you'd asked me what my five-year plan was for the, the distillery, one of our, our, obviously our biggest assets and one of the things we're most proud about, despite my accent, is this connection to Tasmania. Yeah. So Tassie's, Tassie's the, probably the state that least people have heard of. Um, and it's, the, it's also the, 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 the sort of territory that um, is quite, you know, uh, proud of its identity. It's a bit like, a bit like Isla. Mm-hmm. Um, in that we have this island mentality down here. Um, and it was really bizarre because people used to say to us, it's not Tazi gin if you don't use Tazi spirit, but no one makes neutral spirit down here. You know, <laughs> like it's just, it's not there. Like even the the local vodka, uh, Hearts Horn, which is made from Sheep's Way, um, can get spirit up to 95% alcohol, but it's in such a small still, it will never be classified as neutral. Um, right. And it is one of the best vod- vodkas you've ever tasted. but it doesn't work with it would never work with our gin and it would cost mm. us so much money that our gin would you know go through the roof in terms of price so we've always we've always had to buy a neutral spirit from the mainland which isn't it's never been an issue and um, we distill all the botanicals on site um but I'd, i would have said that a five-year plan would have been pretty cool to make our own neutral spirit um and then when you know the the, the current sort of situation changed down here with the pandemic um we realized very very quickly uh, because we had pharmacies basically calling us and asking about hand sanitizer. So we realized there was a, a Tassie shortage, never mind a national or a global shortage. And um, what we found is all the, the big producers on the mainland of this neutral spirit cut us off. You know, we, we had, they said we, we could get what we'd ordered, but after that, they were diverting everything to sanitizer on the mainland, which is, you know, fair enough. But yeah. from a Tassie perspective, it didn't help us. So we thought outside the box we got as much neutral spirit as we could so we reached out to our friends in the wine industry who use it to fortify their port and their sherry or their tawny and their apera mm-hmm. so those those uh, connections came in real handy we had some stock on hand for gin that we were you know we were, we were due to produce so we, we turned that into sanitizer as well and then we started to realize that that shortage wasn't going away so we then called our, our local um still producers a company called still smiths here in tazi um and asked them if they'd ever built a column still and the answer was no hmm. we asked them if they thought they could build a column still and the answer was yes and then we asked them if they thought that you know if we put knocked their heads together would they be able to build one in six weeks wow okay <laughs> now we had that we had that discussion on the 3rd of april and installation starts a week today nice resounding success it's fantastic. So they, they reached out to their friends at Bundaberg who engineered uh, local uh, rum stills up there. And um, I put the guys in, in sort of, I gave them a direction in terms of what we wanted to produce. And, and what we we're going to end up with um, is probably beyond my wildest dreams. What I thought we were going to get would have been a, a pot column hybrid that you see in, in many craft distilleries. So mm-hmm. you chuck a bunch of... Um, uh, you know, 14, 15% alcohol in the pot and then you distill it off and eventually you get neutral spirit at the end. What we're actually going to get is a full-on coffee continuous column still. 
So we can basically produce it, you know, we, as, as long as we keep feeding it with booze, it will keep giving us 95% at the other end. So uh, to my knowledge, it's the, going to be the smallest continuous still uh, in the world. It's six meters high hmm. and uh, it will produce a thousand liters a day uh, if we run it over six, 16 hour shift um, at 95% alcohol, which is nuts. So yeah. it's, it's one of those things where, you know, a couple of, a couple of, I would say, uh, local companies, we've knocked our heads together and, and tried to problem solve the shortage. Uh, and we've come up with a solution that is not, not only has legs and will give us, you know, gin spirit for the long term, but also mm-hmm. it will allow other Tazi gins to buy Tazi spirit if they wish. Um, and it means, means that we can put out 1,200 litres of sanitizer a, a day if need be. Um, and given the fact that, you know, we're, we're about to have a bunch of businesses reopen here that are going to need this stuff, mm. um, it means we can, we can keep them in supply. So it's, it's one of those just amazing stories that if we hadn't, yeah, it, let, let's put it this way, if we hadn't sort of kept our eye on the ball and saw that pivot opportunity, um, there, you know, there, there could have been much worse consequences, I guess, mm. than, uh, than getting a, a nice shiny new piece of kit. So. Yeah. Really, yeah, it's very really cool. elegant solution. Now, this, yeah. this question really is going to be mostly for the kids who grew up in the 90s like me, but it might help also <laughs> remind people where Tasmania is on the map. But it feels like there's always going to be this background danger that a Tasmanian devil is going to blow through the distillery and knock everything <laughs> out of action. Do you have any safeguards in place against this? Um, Tazi devils are... You, you, you probably, you, you would be surprised at how, uh, how many of them there actually are, but you'd also be surprised that they're actually scavengers. They're not really hunters. Mm. Um, quite amazing animals. The, um, you, you, you do see them every so often, but uh, the biggest danger at the distillery isn't Tazi Devil. So I've, in, in my, my time on the distilling floor, I've had a sheep walk into the distillery, <laughs> um, just randomly walked in because the gate was open. Yep. Um, We've had red, red uh, not red tongue, blue, blue tongue lizards. So they're probably about that length. They're absolutely amazing creatures. Mm. Um, so rep- reptiles with, with bright blue tongues. Um, the biggest Practice danger the at the heat, distillery, maybe. yeah, potentially, potentially. You get, load, you get loads of them in the summer. Um, oh. The biggest danger at the distillery is the spider, though. You, you, you don't want to you know, come across any more than, than uh, a few nests of those a year. Mm. Um, so they're, they're, again, they're, they're pretty awesome looking creatures, but they're, they could be pretty aggressive. So you, you want to keep them away. I may have hit a small um, uh, snag there, um, with, so I didn't quite hear it clearly. Could you repeat the, the last animal? Uh, so the last animal was the, the red back spider. Mm. So one of the most venomous spiders in, in Tazi, uh, in the world actually. So yeah, we have the odd, the odd nest of them show up and then we'll get the, uh, the, the old pest control into to, to remove them. Um, but yeah, T- Tazi's got an incredible, uh, incredible array of, of wildlife to keep you occupied. They, um, probably the echidnas, my, my favorite thing that I've seen. So that's a, a monotreme that looks a bit like a hedgehog. Mm. Um, and the, the, the two that are elusive, the two I haven't seen in the wild yet, um, are the, it's the, um, duck platypus. Yeah. Um, again, just incredible animal. And I've, I've only really seen one snake. Um, but that's probably not a bad thing considering all the snakes here are, are pretty deadly. Incredibly lethal. This is, this is one point where I see Tasmania really diverging from the kind of Scotland on the other side of the world. It's, uh, <laughs> the wildlife has, <laughs> has, has some very big differences in it. Yes. Yeah. That being said, I went to the Northern Territory on holiday last year and, you know, I'd, I'd take what we have down here over the crocodiles any day. <laughs> Fair. So yeah. I think just like to round this off with uh, your own personal preference. What would be your desert island dram? If you found yourself stranded on an island even smaller and even less populated, just yourself, what would be your desert island whiskey? Oof, that's, um, that's one of those questions, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I mean, there's, a, there's, there's, there's numerous, numerous answers. I think if it's in terms of stuff that, uh, that, that we do down here, uh, I still will 100% back our classic cask any time. So that's our generally cask between four and seven years old, matured in port and sherry. So if it was a Tazzy whiskey, I would take that uh, over any others. But 
Um, the two that I keep coming back to just now, the two that I always have in my cupboard, um, I've actually got them here. Um, huh. I, I still think that Glen Morin G18 for a nice, bright, sort of fruity um, single malt is extremely difficult to beat. Um, mm. I, I can drink that any time of the day. And then the one that, that gets me from a technical perspective, just because I can't quite understand how they do it, uh, is the Ben Romick 15. Ah, right, yeah. Just the balance between sherry and smoke in that is is unbelievable. It hits every part of the palate I want it to hit. Um, it gets my taste buds flowing. And it has this kind of real nice, uh, I would say, grunge to it that, that I really love. Um, the only thing that probably comes close to it is Ben Nevis in terms mm. of distilleries. But the Ben Romick 15 for me in terms of balance. Yeah, if it was a stormy island, I'd take that one. And if it was a desert island where the sun's shining, I'd be taking the Glen Morangie every day of the week. Beautiful. Well, I think I have to say, Craig Johnston, thank you very much for joining us. Um, really interesting to hear the similarities and differences of distilling on the other side of the world. And I think really the strongest message from that is uh, be intrepid, visit Isla, visit Tassie, go to the smaller places that make whiskey and you'll get a pretty nice welcome. Yeah, absolutely. It's been a, a real pleasure, Sam, and uh, hopefully we can catch up again soon. That'd be great. Take care now. All right. Excellent. Cheers.